So the neocortex is the largest part uh, of the uh, mammalian brain, and it's really a complex network made out of many neurons connected into complex networks by uh, synapses. Um, synapses are these tiny structures uh, in the neuropil. They consist of presynaptic terminals, swellings in the axons, which are opposed to dendritic spines, which are these, these hair-like structures that come off the dendrite. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence in the cortex between these presynaptic terminals and these uh, dendritic spines. So let's focus on this cartoon of a synapse here over on the right. When an action potential zips through the axon, uh, it invades these synaptic terminals and causes glutamate release, which then binds to postsynaptic receptors uh, on the uh, po uh, postsynaptic dendritic spine. And so there are many uh, questions uh, that uh, remain to be answered about synaptic transmission and plasticity. For example, how spatially localized is our synaptic uh, transmission and plasticity? Uh, for example, is glutamate uh, released from uh, individual uh, synaptic terminals sensed by receptors on only one dendritic spine, or does it spill over to activate neighboring dendritic spines? And similar uh, for synaptic plasticity, long-term changes in the efficacy of synaptic function. Can individual synapses change, or do synapses always change in groups? And answers to these questions are important uh, because they challenge our understanding of uh, uh, the information processing capacity of the brain. The more independent synaptic transmission is, of course, the larger the information uh, processing capacity of the brain is because there will be more independent information transmission channels in the brain. Similarly, in terms of synaptic plasticity, the more independent synaptic plasticity is, uh, the larger the memory storage capacity of the brain is because uh, there are more, uh, it can store more bits. And also, if uh, synaptic transmission and plasticity are independent at the level of individual synapses, that in turn challenges our understanding of the spatial regulation of uh, signal transduction in synapses. Um, activation of synapses activates complex biochemical pathways which feed back onto uh, synaptic function, which then changes the structure and function of synapses. For example, through the insertion of AMPA receptors, glutamate receptors, into the postsynaptic density. And uh, uh, synapses are very tightly packed along the dendrites, about one uh, per micrometer of dendritic length. And so the question then is, how can these intracellular biochemical pathways be regulated at the micrometer level in these uh, neuronal microcompartments? I'd like to remind you that neurons have an output side, uh, the axon here in blue, uh, and an input side, uh, uh, the dendrite here in red. And when an action potential is generated by presynaptic neurons, uh, in green is the action potential, uh, it propagates throughout the axonal arbor. And then uh, where axons and dendrites overlap in the neuropil, sometimes synapses occur. And when the action potential reaches uh, the synapse, um, it causes a synaptic transmission. There are a large number of synapses in, in the dendritic arbor and the axonal arbor of uh, individual neurons. Uh, neurons have about 10,000 um, outputs and 10,000 inputs, and individual synapses are really quite uh, weak. Uh, it takes about 10 to 20, perhaps 30 uh, synapses firing almost simultaneously to drive the postsynaptic neuron to fire. Um, and so individual synapses have a very weak impact onto uh, the postsynaptic um, dendrite, onto the postsynaptic neuron. So how do these synapses look? Here's an electron micrograph, um, uh, uh, electron microscopy image of a thin section of a cortical tissue, a cross section uh, through a synapse. And notice the tiny length scale here. This, the entire image is only about uh, two micrometers or so in diameter. And you can see the presynaptic terminal chock full of vesicles filled with excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate opposed to a dendritic spine. Uh, the postsynaptic specialization. Uh, here is the spine head of the dendritic spine, uh, which is connected through a th thin neck, not shown here, to the parent dendrite. Uh, notice also between uh, the presynaptic specialization and the postsynaptic specialization a light area, uh, which is the uh, synaptic cleft into which the uh, neurotransmitter spills upon uh, 
uh, glutamate release. Notice also the uh, uh, electron dense or dark structure on the postsynaptic side, which is the postsynaptic density, which contains the receptors for neurotransmitter, signaling molecules, uh, scaffolding protein, and also cell adhesion molecules that keep pre- and postsynaptic structures um, together. Now, you can, from these electron microscopy images, from individual images of individual 50 nanometer sections, you can build up a picture of how, uh, of a 3D picture of how these synapses look. And here is an example. Um, in green is the axon. In yellow, one five micron uh, length dendritic segment with one uh, dendritic spine here. And you can see from this electron microscopy 3D reconstruction that along the dendrite synapses are packed rather tightly. There's about one synapse, one to two synapses per micrometer um, of uh, dendrite in these uh, pyramidal cells. And also in the neural pill, if you now reconstruct all of the axons in the neural pill, you can see that it's really quite dense. There are about a thousand axonal elements in this uh, six by six by six roughly micrometer cube um, of cortical tissue and that just sort of highlights the complexity of the tissue in which uh, synapses are embedded and uh, synapses really have to be studied in individual tissue in intact tissues because uh, in uh, synapses are not really uh, really don't have the same properties in uh, cultured uh, preparations.